Uh, good, good afternoon. afternoon. I'm, I'm Alvin on Graylin. Even though I work for a virtual reality company, uh, what I want to talk to you guys today about is actually not about virtual reality as much. It's really more about the underlying foundational beliefs that we guide our lives with today. So what I want to talk to you, you'll have a better sense of what are some of the changing things in technology that's going to affect your ongoing beliefs. So we're very fortunate to be living in a time where it's the most peaceful time in the history of this earth. We're also very fortunate to be in a time where technology is advancing at a rapid rate and we have the most available information that we've ever had. And our quality of life is better than it's ever been. So congratulations to all of you for being so lucky to be in this time. So there's a number of technologies that I wanted to highlight today. And uh, there's quite a few. I'm not going to go through all of them in detail. But you know, these are the trends. These are technologies that will be impacting our lives for the next several decades. Robotics will take over a lot of the manual work. Blockchain, which is helping create the, the bitcoins that are reaching daily highs. Uh, High-speed connectivity that makes the world's information available at our fingertips. Biotech that now uh, has come up with something called CRISPR that can allow us to go and edit our genes. You have augmented virtual reality uh, that we'll talk a little bit about more soon. And artificial intelligence that's been the hot topic for this year. Climate change that uh, we need to really be concerned about even though there are presidents in this world that don't believe in it. Privacy is actually going to be increasing an issue for this earth as more and more data is being created by all the devices that we carry around us. And aging is also going to be something that affects this entire earth and spe specifically China because China is going to have a reverse pyramid of more and more elderly people. So 500 years ago, this is what the world believed, that we lived on a flat earth. Right? In fact, Galileo went to jail for a large part of his life because he was promoting that the sun, or that we revolved around the sun versus the other way around. So, you know, we really want to make sure that uh, this isn't how things are going to be going forward. We need to recognize that there are going to be major changes in the way that we believe things and how that's going to affect our own actions. Technology is changing not at, at a linear rate, but actually at an accelerating rate. And that's what's most exciting, is that every single year, the amount of change that's happening is greater than the year before the impact that they are having is greater than the year before. Right? So progress is going to happen, and it's going to happen in you know, increasingly um, orders of magnitude in terms of how it changes. And there's two main factors that's helping uh, increase this, this uh, change. One is integration, which is a lot of different technologies coming together, and then also digitalization, which is turning physical products into virtual products. So one really good example of integration is the integrated circuit. This is a picture of a uh, microprocessor. I was very fortunate that I actually grew up with the microprocessor. It was born in 1971, the first microprocessor by Intel, which was the year I was born. And I've grown up with that entire industry uh, since then. People were saying, hey, isn't Moore's Law going to come to an end? Isn't there physical limitations? And what I want to show you is this picture. This is actually a picture of an exponential growth. It's taking Moore's Law back 100 years, 120 years. In fact, what happens is that every time there is a limit, physical limit, there's a new technology that's created, a new paradigm that's created that then removes those barriers, right? When the mechanical computers became limited, the relay systems came. When relay systems became limited, vacuum tubes came, and then transistors and integrated circuits. And going forward, we're going to have quantum computing or biocomputing or other types of, of ways to compute. So I wanted to show you a quote because it has such a profound impact on me. When I was with Intel, I remember I was in a long-range planning meeting with uh, Annie Grove, and we spent an hour going back and forth about whether we should pursue a particular strategic project. And nobody could really make up their mind. And then he stopped us and he says, hey, guys, what if you had unlimited power, you had unlimited bandwidth, would this decision still be so difficult? And that actually changed a lot for me. Not necessarily because of what that specific case, but what that really meant was, hey, there's a new way of thinking. Don't always be limited by the constraints that we put on ourselves. Right? Most of the time, when we have a difficult decision to make, it's because we've put artificial constraints. 
that's limited our thinking. Another integration that's happened over the last 20 years is the, the internet. Essentially, you're putting all the networks in the world into one network, making all the information in the world instantly accessible. And you know, I spend a lot of time in, in this industry. In fact, I had my first venture-backed startup, not in the beginning of the internet bubble, but during the initial crash of the internet bubble, right? In 2000, when I graduated from my MIT, I got venture-funded, and then actually about two months after the bubble crash, I got venture-funded. And I learned the most from those year and a half of the most difficult time of running a business. If you ever run a business during a market crash, you learn a lot more. Trust me, it's better. It's actually a much better learning opportunity than going when the market's just going up because you think you're a genius and when everything's going well, but when it crashes, that's when you know what, what really matters. So in the last 10 years, one of the key integration factors is this. It's integrating all of the computers and devices that we spend our daily lives with into something that we can hold in our hands. So as that happens, you're, you actually free yourself. You don't have to be in the office anymore and you can still access the information. You can you know, be able to, to, to work productive, productively in, in any place and with anyone. This device we are more dependent on, something that this small, we're more dependent on than all the other devices in our lives today. And very soon, there will be other devices that's gonna be even more important. This is a technology that's going to be changing our next several decades. It's a technology where we essentially not integrating different devices together, but more importantly, we're integrating our senses. We are putting our, our, our sight, our sound, sense of hearing, our sense of touch, our sense of motion, all into a single device. By integrating that, we have the closest and most personalized technology that we've had to date. So and I, I have to thank two people for making this possible for me. One is on the left, uh, Dr. Tom Furness. He's the, the godfather of VR, the guy who invented the first VR and AR device about 50, 52 years ago. And I was, I was his uh, student about 26 years ago uh, when he first opened up his uh, head lab. I also have to thank uh, Ms. Sher Wong, who is the CEO of HTC, and she was uh, so gracious to invite me to join this company and participate in creating this new revolution. So HTC has done a lot of things in the last few years that has really impacted the, the VR industry. 2015, we introduced the first room scale VR system, allowing somebody to put on a headset and walk around an entire room and feel as if they were there and have that one-to-one -one correspondence of your physical movement to your virtual movement. In 2016, we created the first phone that was dedicated for VR, giving you the optimal mobile uh, experience. And just two weeks ago, we released this product, we announced this product. This is the first standalone six degrees of freedom VR system that allows you to walk around in unlimited space. So, but some people will say, hey, you know, these devices look great, but you know, they're too big. I don't want to bring them around the, uh, you know, outside at home. It's embarrassing. In a, in a way, I, I think as a first generation type of products, these are excellent. But you know, in a few years, you're going to get to devices like this. This is a concept from uh, Givenchy. They're a uh, you know, fashion company. So you know, they can make, they're, they're looking at in a few years for devices to look more like these. You know, how many of you would be interested in wearing something like this outside? Uh, and it also provides you instant access to all the information that you would need uh, anywhere. So with devices like this, you know, we really have to start asking ourselves some new questions. So what does it mean to be in an office? What does it mean to have an office? Right? Do we really need to have an office? Or you know, do we need parking lots anymore? If we can free up all that space that used to be reserved for parking lots and, and offices, you know, how much more space in real estate does that allow for us? Or you look at something like this. You know, the, the classroom that we go to school with, our children go to school in, they haven't changed for 100 years. But with technology like what we're seeing today, you can have your children go to classroom that look like this. But what's even more important is that they can have unlimited access to the best teachers around the world and interacting with the best students around the world, right? giving them a new way to learn. What we found from our, from our research is that the, the same students, uh, the same group of students were taught two different ways, one with VR, one without, and the worst student in the VR class beat the best student in the, in the standard uh, control group. You know, that's, that's really amazing because what that means is that every child is a genius and we've just been teaching them with the wrong methods. What about art? What about, you know, uh, music? 
with VR, you actually create a brand new medium, a brand new medium for creatives to, to think. And in fact, what we found uh, with some other research we've recently done is that if you give children early enough access to VR, their answers to questions become significantly more creative. They're able to solve problems in new ways that they weren't able to be before. So it's not just about using art for art's sake. It actually, art makes us better people, makes us smarter people. And what about travel? A lot of us, uh, I think, in the business world spend way too much time traveling on the road for business, etc. If you could put on a headset and travel to anywhere in the world, you know, and be with anyone and have a shared real experience, you know, how much would that save in terms of delayed flights and ecological damage that comes from our far carbon footprint? So all of this is made possible because there's actually another integration point. Your, your brain. All of these senses actually goes into one organ. So as we talk about more and more integration, integration happens at very various levels, from the, the, the gate and chip level to now to the census level. Last week announced we invest in a company that specifically does brain-computer interface, in measuring the brain waves that come out of our brain and using that to control our devices. You know, this looks a little bit clunky today, but in a few years, there will be devices that make you, whatever you think, will happen in that interface, in that screen. It, it, the way to think about it is, you know, every night we do something that is very similar to good quality virtual reality. It's called dreaming. So when you dream, you feel like you're doing something real. Until you wake up, you actually felt like that was a real experience, and you didn't even have to move. This is what good virtual reality will be like. So in a few years, when high quality VR gets to a, a, a point where it's indistinguishable from a dream, then we know we've arrived. So what this actually now th uh, says is, hey, we actually have to ask ourselves some even deeper question. So, so what, what is reality, right? You have uh, experts in the world, people like uh, Elon Musk, that recently was quoted, and he says, if you assume that there's, there's any a rate of improvement in law and in technology that games will soon become indistinguishable from reality. In fact, he says that chances are we are already in a simulation. So all of you guys could actually be just in part of a big you know, virtual reality game. So a lot of things, another thing that a lot of people are, are very concerned about or worried about is uh, artificial intelligence. And people are afraid of it because they don't understand it. Artificial intelligence isn't something that's going to make us slaves to robots. Artificial intelligence is something that will free our minds to be more creative because it will take all the mundane things that are part of our daily lives and make that automatic. It will take all the memories that are part of everybody's lives and make it accessible so that we can remember everything. And what that does is it actually does another integration. It, it essentially links and networks all of our brains into one giant brain, makes us all super intelligent, right? Because if you have a super intelligent artificial intelligence, it will make you super intelligent, and you can spend your time doing the things that you're really good at, and that's the creative side, that's the human side of what we are. Today, the foundations to our reality are based on scarcity, that you know, there are limited things in the world, and we need to fight for our share of that limited, you know, limited pie that time is limited because we only can live a very short time on this earth, and that location matters because that's where the rest of the people are, and you have to be at a specific place to go to work or to school, right? And that money is critical because if you don't have money, you can't go buy all those things that you really want. And that IQ is the key to success, right? That's what always the thing that we're learning, and at the end, we do all want to get status. We want to be somebody famous. We want to be somebody rich. We want to be somebody powerful, right? But are these the right type of foundations that we should be building our lives on? Or should we be looking at a, a different al alternative where the world becomes much more abundant? Everything you need can be virtual, so why does it have to be a limited time? Your time becomes more flexible because you don't necessarily need to be in an office or go on that flight or you know, have that long commute every day. Your location doesn't matter because when you put on a headset that's high quality or you put on a, one of these devices, you could be anywhere and you could feel like you're actually there in person. And money doesn't really matter so much anymore because now you don't have to buy all the physical goods. You know, when you spend most of your time in a virtual world, it doesn't matter if you have the latest purse or the latest shoes or the latest gadget. 
And when an artificial intelligence system has a higher IQ than all of us combined, you know, do we really need IQ or do we really need imagination? Because it's this imagination that's something that you know, cannot be replaced by technology. And instead of seeking status, what's probably more important is seeking purpose. I think all of you know, and if you're here, you're one of the people in the world that's actually trying to do something more with your life, trying to have greater impact. And it's having that purpose that we should be all spending our time thinking about and making that impact that then leaves a legacy to the world. So when astronauts come back from going in space, they usually have a newfound belief, a newfound uh, attitude towards life and the things that they care about. And you know, hopefully by understanding kind of where the future is going and what are some of the key technologies that are impacting them, you know, my talk today might start to give you some of that concept and hopefully you'll take some time and go and research the other nine trends or technologies I would mention in the first couple of slides and really gain that understanding because I think most people are afraid of technology because they don't understand it. And once you do, you start to appreciate the value that it, it provides. So I want to leave you with a very important question. So if time, money, and location were not a factor anymore, if you had all the money you needed and you could live anywhere in the world, would you still be doing what you're doing today? Or would you be doing something else? This is similar to the question that Andy Grove asked me you know, 20 something years ago on that particular case. But I think this question is even more important because this question hopefully will give you a direction that will help guide you in terms of what you want to spend the rest of your time on this earth doing. What kind of a world do we want to leave for our children, for our grandchildren, for their grandchildren? You know, if you can answer that last question, I think you'll leave it a better place. Thank you.